We're recording. Y'all is good, man. Sabbath peace. Uh oh, brother T, you still there? Nope. Uh oh, let's see what happened. What happened to you? Uh, you dropped off again. I don't know. All right, well, Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth that is given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given it freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, uh, to the saints watching in on the camera, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. So last week we talked about uh what well you know what I'm saying brother T recap us on what we talked about last week. Uh, we talked about Isaiah <clears throat> talked about um the prophecy that he gave King Ahaz let him know that the uh, virgin was going to conceive a son. Talked about how Isaiah was prophesying against Judah as well. Uh talking about how you know if they don't speak according to the word or the word of the prophets Cause there ain't no light in them. That's right. And you remember Isaiah when, you know what I'm saying? We started off at, at chapter six of Isaiah and he had a vision. He actually saw the most high God sitting on the throne with a long train. And he had two cherubim sitting on each side of him with six wings each and two wings covered the face and two wings covered the feet and the other two wings they used to fly. Right. And they spoke and they began to spoke and give speak and give, give uh, glory to the most high God. And then when, when Isaiah saw that, that they was giving glory to the most high God, at that point, he started to feel guilty, right? He started to feel how, you know, he's like, I'm a man of unclean lips, right? I shouldn't even be here. I'm a man of unclean lips. And they got the cold and they, they purged his sin from him. And then the most high God asked, he said, who should I send? He said, Isaiah, right? And then he ended up sending Isaiah out. So that was our introduction to Isaiah. And then like Brother T said, we went on to talk about some prophecy for, for uh, the King Ahaz, which, you know what I'm saying? If you look on the screen, we can zoom it in for everybody so y'all can see on the on the stream. But if you look here, King Ahaz, let me see here. Boom, here we go. Let me get my, my pen out. Oh, why, why take away my, oh, I don't like that. I wanted to zoom in. So if you look here, um, just follow my mouse a little bit here. You can see that we talked about Isaiah. So we, we in this part of Isaiah right here. Isaiah is kind of talking to King Ahaz and he had a prophecy for him. And it's important for us to understand and remember why he had that prophecy, right? What was that prophecy about? So originally Isaiah was given a message to say, hey, listen, it's about to go down, right? The king of a uh, king of Syria, not Assyria, the king of Syria and then the king of Israel are about to be confederate together. In other words, they're about to conspire against you, right? And Isaiah, Isaiah was to give Ahaz this word to let him know it's not going to come to pass. Then the Most High God asked Ahaz, he said, give me a sign. I mean, tell me the sign that you want me to give you. But Ahaz was like, no, nah, I ain't going to worry the Most High God. You know what I'm saying? I don't even need a sign. And that made God mad. So he started giving them a prophecy about the destruction of Judah altogether. We read that, but now we're about to read it from uh, the perspective of, uh, of uh, Chronicles in the perspective of Kings to kind of see how King Ahaz, you know, kind of dealt with that information. Like, what did he do with the information that Isaiah gave him? OK, but before we get to Ahaz. You know what I'm saying? We got to talk about the other kings, right? We on, we we left off, I think, on Uzziah uh, talking about Jotham. So now let's read about Jotham. Then we'll read about Ahaz. Uh, and then we'll kind of get into, to, you know, whatever else we have. All right. So let's go to uh, 
first, I mean, second Kings chapter 15. I think we left off about verse, uh, maybe 30. Oh, uh, we left off on second Kings eight. That was the last time we read Kings. Second Kings. Uh, no, we left off second Kings 15. Remember we talked about we talked about yeah. Pika. Uh, let me see. Where am I? Yeah, I think Pika in like about halfway through. Okay. So we should be uh just just pick me up at about uh let me check my note here. Yeah. Um pick me up at about okay. give me actually let's just go to Chronicles. Chronicles might might let's go to second Chronicles chapter twenty seven, verse one. That'll clean us up because Chronicles gonna give us a little bit more about Jotham. It's Second Chronicles, chapter uh, chapter uh, twenty seven, verse one. Jotham was twenty five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to mm -hmm. all that his father Uzziah did. Howbeit he entered not into the temple of the Lord. The people. All right. So you remember, corrupted. you remember Uzziah also went by the name Azariah, right? So Uzziah was the one that the, the book told us. They're like, oh no, nah, he was. You know, what I'm saying he did. He did pretty good, right? He followed after the, the Most High God, except at the end he started to have be, uh, be built with pride, and so he went in. To the temple and he lit incense right so it's calling him out he's like yeah he was just like his daddy he did right but then now the writer of chronicles is telling us but he didn't go into the temple right it's just making that distinction like he was just like his dad but he didn't mess up in the same way let's keep going he built the high gate of the house of yahuwah and on the wall of ophel he built much or mm -hmm. he built cities in the mountains of judah and in the forests he built castles and towers he fought also with the king of the Amorites, Ammonites, and prevailed against him. And the children of Ammon gave him the same year a hundred talents of silver and 10,000 measures of wheat and 10,000 of barley. So much did the children of Ammon pay unto him both the second year and the third. Right. So he started to collect tribute from the Ammonites. Right. If you remember, David started to do that first. And then Solomon increased it, right? David took over everybody that was around Israel. He started to build a, a small, a small empire. And then Solomon stepped on the the stepped into the empire that David built, and he made it even greater. But then since then, you had Rehoboam and many other kings after that. The empire began to dwindle, and to the point that we began we we began to be subjugated to the uh to the wills and to the uh, will of uh Edom, right? And a number of other nations. So now Jotham, he in his strength, the most high guy started to bless him. Now he's going to the Ammonites and he he's defeating them, and now they're paying tribute to him. Right? Keep going. So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all his wars in his ways, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. He was five and 20 years old when he began to reign and reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And Jotham slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. And Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. All right. So now we talk about Ahaz. Right. So Ahaz is the son of Jotham. And now Ahaz is reigning in his, st in his stead. Right. In instead of him. Right. So let's keep going. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. Mm -hmm. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Baalim. Moreover, the burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt, and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Right, so this these are... These are gross sins that he's committing, right? He's sacrificing places he, ought, he shouldn't be sacrificing. He's even sacrificing his children, right? So he's sacrificing children, letting them pass through the fire. And that's something that the Most High God hate and that he commanded us not to do uh, even when Moses was giving us our law, right? Keep going. 
he sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried him away a great multitude of them captive and brought them to Damascus. And he all and he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. Mm -hmm. Rebekah, the son of Remliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, which were all valiant men, because they had forsaken Yahuwah, their, fa their fathers. Mm -hmm. Yahuwah, their fathers. And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Manasseh, Messiah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the governor of the house, and El Elkanah, that was next to the king. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren, 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of Yahuwah was there whose name was Oded. And he went on before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because Yahuwah, God of your fathers, was wroth with Judah, he has delivered. Look, he said, Because Yahuwah, the God of your fathers, was wroth with Judah. Watch this. He has delivered them into your hand. And ye have slain them in a rage that reaches up unto heaven. And right. Now, so now listen, pay attention to what's happening. The prophet here, Odeh, he's telling them, because Yahuwah was wroth with Judah, he let the kingdom of Israel, the northern tribes, take some of people, some of the people of Judah captive. Right? Now, this was a judgment of the most high God. The, mo the most high God is saying, okay, so let's rewind. Let's let's hold what we got. I just want to remind y'all what we read last week, right? So we hold what we got. Let's go back to Isaiah. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 7. This is Isaiah chapter 7. Because this gives the pretext to what we're reading right now. Isaiah chapter 7, give me verse 1. Because we need to understand why specifically is the Most High God mad about this situation right now. This is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that reasoned the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remliah, king of Israel, went up towards Jerusalem to war against it, but could mm -hmm. not prevail against it. Mm -hmm. and it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved in his heart and the heart of the people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. So now what Isaiah is telling us is the rumors began to come out that Syria and Israel are teaming up together against Judah. So all the people got scared, right? Watch this. Then said Yahuwah unto Isaiah, go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jeshu, thy son, and at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tales of these smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remliah. Because mm -hmm. Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. But what, Yahuwah? Thus says Yahuwah God, it shall not stand, neither shall it He said it shall not what? Shall not stand. So now, a prophecy from Isaiah went to the king, Ahaz, after all these rumors came out. Ahaz is hearing about it. Hey, man, I heard, I heard them boys teaming up against you. They about to get your butt, right? All the people start hearing about it. Then a prophecy went to Isaiah and then to Ahaz. And the prophecy said, yo, I know all this is being said, but it will not stand. Right? Keep going. Watch this. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Mm -hmm. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Right? So he told him, if you will not believe, he's talking to Ahaz. Hey, Ahaz, I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. These boys got about 60-something years. These boys is done. Right? Trust me, I understand this stuff. But if you won't believe what I'm telling you, you will not be established is what he's telling them, right? Keep going, watch this. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of Yahuwah thy God, and ask it either in depth 
or in height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. So now, why do you think the Most High God was asking for a sign, asking him to tell him, you know, to give him a sign? So that he can believe. He wanted to help him believe because he's telling him, listen, if you don't believe this, you're not going to be established. So now Ahaz, with some false humility is the way I look at it, he like, no, 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 I don't want to tempt God. Right? But then he turns around and he does the things that, uh, that we just read. Right? So he goes in and he ends up being taken over by these boys. But there's a reason for that. Right? There is a reason for that. So let's go back to uh, where were we at? Second Chronicles 28. Uh, 28 verse 9. Verse 9. Go back to verse 1 for me. Second, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 1. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and his reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did mm -hmm. that which was not right, which was which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He did that. He, he did not. He did not that which was mm -hmm. right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images of Baalim. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. he sacrificed also the burnt incense to the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Wherefore, the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with the great slaughter. Mm -hmm. For Pekah the son of Remliah slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, which were all valiant men, because they had forsaken Yahuwah, the God of their fathers. Mm -hmm. Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Messiah, Messiah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah, that was next to the king. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brother and 200,000 women, sons, and daughters. And took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because Yahuwah God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he has delivered them into your hand. And ye have slain them in a rage that reaches up to heaven. Mm -hmm. And now you purpose to keep under the children of Judah in Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you? But are there not with you, even with you, sins against Yahuwah your God? Mm -hmm. Now hear me, therefore, and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren, for fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Yehovah, Berechiah, the son of Meshillamah, and Jezekiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hedali, stood up against them that came from the war. And said unto them, "Ye shall not bring the captives here, for whereas we have offended against Yahuwah already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to your trespass, for our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath, fierce wrath upon Israel." All right. So now the captives of Judah were brought to the northern kingdom, right? And then after that, one of the people amongst the captives was a prophet, and he spoke like, "Yo, yo, yo, you you gonna have to do that. look." Y'all was allowed to win this just because the Most High God was mad at Judah. But now what you're doing is reaching up to the Most High God and he's not liking this. You already got some wrath sitting on top of you. Why would you increase it this way? Right? So then some of the folks was like, oh, he right. Let these people go. We got enough on our back right now. Let them go. Let's see what happens. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. And the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives and with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them and arrayed them and shod them and gave them to eat and drink and anointed them and carried the feeble ones upon donkeys 
and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. At that time did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him. Of course, he did him. what now? The king Ahaz sent unto the kings of Assyria to help him. And this is where he messed up. The most I got already told him, look, these boys going to try to do this stuff. It's not going to stand. A prophet of the most high God just stopped some of the people from being captive. Right. However, Ahaz reached out to the king of Assyria. And he asked him for help. Right. Keep going. Watch this. For again, the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines mm -hmm. also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh and Ahalon and Gitaroth and Shoko with the valleys thereof and Timnah with the villages thereof, Gimzo also the villages thereof, and they dwelt there. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he, he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against Yahuwah. Mm -hmm. And with Peleser, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. For Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the house of the king and out of the house of the princes and gave it unto the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. And in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against Yahuwah? This is that king Ahaz. Right. So instead of getting help from the king of Assyria, the king of Assyria came down and he just started robbing him. Like, no, nah, give me that and give me that, too. And give me that, too. Right. Let's look at it from uh, from from the perspective of the writer in Kings. This is second, uh, second Kings, chapter 16. Second Kings, chapter 16, give me verse one. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Mm -hmm. 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of Yahuwah, his God, like David, his father. But he mm -hmm. walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abomination of the heathen, whom Yahuwah had cast out from before the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. He sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places, and on the hills and under every green tree. Then Reason, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, Remaliah, king of Israel, came to came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. Right? Ahaz, so now look. Now Kings is giving us a little bit more of the story. So before they start taking stuff over, they came up and they besieged. In other words, Ahaz had walls up, and they started to fight against the walls, but they couldn't overtake it. So remember that at this point, Ahaz had already got a message from Isaiah telling him, yo, these people are going to try to come up against you. The rumors are true, but it's not going to work. It's not going to stand. Most I got already told him. And he also told him, if you don't believe this, it's not going to be established. You're going to lose your footing if you don't believe this. So let me tell you what, just tell me the sign that you'd like to give me to prove to you that this is how it's going to play out. You're going to be okay. He tell him, nah, man, I don't want to tempt the most high God. I don't want to wear you. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to put nothing extra on you. You know what I'm saying? Let's just forget it. That made the most high God mad. So now he finds himself in the war. Just like the most high God said it was going to happen, but he said it wasn't going to stand. Guess what? According to the, the writer of Kings, they trying to break down his walls, but they're not able to overcome. Right? Keep going. Watch this. So Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. And Ahaz right. So then he ended up sending a message to the king of Assyria at that point. He see that they trying to get in. He sent a messenger up there. So what's happening is between the time that the messenger started, because remember, it ain't like he can just pick up a phone and call him in this instant. Somebody has to walk and run from Israel and go all the way to Assyria, right? So that would be pretty much like going from modern day Israel all the way to, uh, what would it be, Iraq, I think? 
Maybe. I think going all the way to like Iraq. Right? That's a long distance. Right? You got to go a long ways. So he sent them. In between that time, they actually begin to overcome. And that's when they started to take them captive. A lot of stuff that we read over in um, in uh, Chronicles just now, that's when all that started to take place. Right? But it's because the Most High God told them, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, you're not going to be established. Just let me give you a sign. But no, no, I don't want to tempt God. That's why we talked about it last week. You can't do that. You can't, you can't play with God like that. That's when, I, when we were talking about in our fellowship hour, we were talking about praying, right? And you got to pray how you feel. Don't be trying to, you know what I'm saying? Don't be trying to pretty it up for God. Don't be trying to say, well, Lord, uh, remove all hatred from my heart, Lord. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, bless my enemies. And like, I know Yahushua said it, and I know that's how we should be. But if that ain't your heart, if that's not how you feel, don't do it. Tell them most I got, you know what I'm saying? Tell them like David was telling them. You know what I'm saying? Curse my enemies. Right? Because that's how I feel. That's really what I'm thinking. That's really what's inside of me right now. The most high God can work with that. But when you try to get this stuff like, oh, no, I believe you, Lord. You know what I'm saying? No, no, no. no. Anything you say, Lord, I don't want to tempt you now. No. You know what I'm saying? No. If the most high God, you ain't tempting him if he's telling you. He's telling you like, yo, you know what I'm saying? Tell me what's going on. Let me give you a sign. No, I don't want to tempt him. See, that's where you mess up. Right. We got to learn from this type of stuff. Right. So we look at it. Ahaz was in position. The most High God was about to have mercy on him. It's not like Ahaz deserved it. Ahaz was already a mess up. Right. So the most High God was about to have mercy on him. And he is about to tell him, like, yo, 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 just trust me. It would have turned his whole life around. Right. However, he got scared. He sent the messenger. Let's keep going. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria hearkened unto him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it and carried mm -hmm. the people of it captive to Ker and slew reason. Right. So now the king of Assyria, he helped him with Damascus. But why do you think he helped him with Damascus? This is more for him. I was going to do that anyway. You know what I'm saying? I was going to take these people anyway. But now you just showed me that you got some money. Okay. Cool. Right? I handled these boys because that was already on my schedule. And then let's see what he do. And King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And king mm -hmm. Ahaz sent to Uriah, the priest, the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it, according to all the workmanship thereof. Right? So now Ahaz end up going to Damascus, and he trying to meet his next boss. He said, listen, king of Assyria, man, I appreciate what you did. You know what I'm saying? Getting these boys off my back here. But uh, look at that altar over there. It's a nice altar. So he saw in Damascus they had an altar. So he called up one of the priests. Remember, this is the king of Judah. He called on one of the priests. He said, look, make me an altar like that. Watch this. And built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah, the priest, made it against, against King Ahaz, came from Damascus. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached to the altar and offered thereon. And he burnt his burnt offering and his meat offering and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of the peace offering upon the altar. And he brought also the brazen altar, which was before Yahuwah from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the altar. And King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, Upon the great altar, burn the morning burnt offering and the evening meat offering and the king's burnt sacrifice and his meat offering with the burnt offering and uh, of all the people of the land and their meat offering and their drink offerings and sprinkle it and sprinkle upon it all the blood, all the burnt offering and all the blood. Of the sacrifice, and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire by. Thus did Uriah the priest, according to all that King Ahaz commanded. And King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases, and removed the laver from off them, and took down the seed from the brazen oxen that were under it, and put it upon a pavement of stones, in the in the cover for the Sabbath that they had built in the house, and the king entry without turned. 
turned he from the house of Yahuwah for the king of Assyria. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaz, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Ahaz slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Right. So it's important for us to kind of like understand what just happened. Right. You have the king of Assyria. I mean, the king of uh, Judah, the king of Judah say, you know what? Uh, I hear what God talking about, but I'm scared. He sent a messenger to the king of Assyria. Right. Now, we've been hearing all this prophecy, starting with Amos. Amos say, yo, 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 Israel, y'all about to be taken. Right. Then after that, we have uh, Hosea. And Hosea was like, yeah, not only is y'all going to be taken, but it's going to be Assyria who takes you. Right. Then we have uh, Isaiah who also comes and he gives a similar message. Right. Like, oh, it's about to go down. Ain't going to be too much longer. These boys are only going to be around for maybe 60 more years. So you have to kind of look at what's happening, like what's playing out. Then Judah calls this same place that Hosea and Isaiah is telling them is going to take over the king, uh, take over Israel. He calls this same place and they end up taking over Damascus, which is one of the, uh, the, the, the countries that was trying to take over uh, Judah. And who you think they're going to try to take over next? They're going to try to take over Israel. Because that's what that's what the king of Judah called them for. The king of Judah said, listen, I need some help. I need you to take down these two places that's trying to get me. My brothers, the Israelites up north and Damascus. Assyria like. OK, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to do that anyway. So he go get Damascus and then he start putting pressure on Judah and taking his money. Right. Putting a lot of pressure on letting them know, like, no, 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 this is how it's going to roll now. I need everything you got. You got to pay tribute to me now. Right. And that's what we was reading when we look at um, when we look at Chronicles. That's what it was kind of telling us. Right. In Chronicles, it was trying to let us know that this is what's playing out. Right. I'm just I'm just putting pressure on him. I'm not really helping him. But Ahaz was so afraid and didn't trust God. So when he was in that position, he thought he was being helped. Right. Let's keep going. Let's look at uh. let's look at uh. we should be on chapter 17. Right. Second chronic. I mean, second Kings chapter 17. Uh, Sister Pamela had a question. Oh, what we got? So she was saying, is it right for Ahaz to build an altar like one in Damascus? Should he get that advice from the priest? No, no, that absolutely wasn't right. Right. Because our our law tells us um, where is it? Let's grab. Uh, uh, let's see. I think it's Exodus chapter 20. Let's grab. Let's grab Exodus chapter 20. I think it's here. If it's not here, then we'll try to find it. But let's do Exodus chapter 20, maybe about verse 13, maybe 14. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not. Oh, no, that's too far up. Give me verse uh, 21. This is Exodus chapter 20, verse 21. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Mm -hmm. The Lord said unto Moses, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver. Neither shall you make unto me gods of gold. And all uh -huh. the earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen, and all the Right, he said an altar of what? Earth. He said an altar of earth. Right? Watch this. And I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build of it hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shall thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Right. So he told us, our law told us that we couldn't put a tool against an altar. Right. If we want to make an altar for the most high God, it got to be of the earth. And if you want to use stones, don't put no tool against it. So the altar, any altar that we use for the most high God, it can't have a tool. Right. So that was absolutely wrong. As soon as he told him to fashion it. That was wrong. He couldn't do that. That's against our law. Right. The the altar that we have came from it came 
specifically from uh, the Most High God to Moses. And he was authorized to make the altar that we had that sit in the temple. But the altar, the altar that uh, he saw in Damascus, that ain't come from the Most High God. What are you supposed to do with that? Most High God can't do nothing with that. That's some other God's altar, right? And so he took that and he was like, yeah, I like that. Go ahead and make it. Then he made the priest of the Most High God do it. Now, the priest should have refused, mm -hmm. right? But the priest was following the orders of the king. And that's going to have to follow. You know, both of them going to be responsible because, you know, the saint, the sanctity of the, uh, of the temple is the responsibility of the priest, mm -hmm. right? King but then the king the, the, is the, the ruler king. of the nation. You yeah, said what? The king can't override the instructions that the priests have to go through. That's right. Yeah, they can't. They can't override yeah, you know the priest orders from God. Yeah, the, our law tells us in Leviticus that the priests bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. All right, so anything that go wrong, that's on the priest. You know what I'm saying? That's that's the responsibility of the priest. So they. That's why. That's why you saw with um, Uzziah or Azariah. When he was standing inside of the temple and he had burned the incense, the priest didn't sit there and be like, okay, well, you know what I'm saying? You the kings, go ahead and burn incense. Nah. You remember it said 60 of them boys came up and they was like, listen, get your butt up out of here. I don't care if you the king or not. Get your butt up out of here. Because the priest not supposed to play that. Right? Let's keep going. Uh, uh, going back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Sister Pamela, I hope that answers the question. If not, just let us know. In the twentieth, in the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hoshea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. And mm -hmm. He did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Against him came up Shema, Shemaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea. So now look, this is the king of Assyria. He's the son of the one that Ahaz called, right? He, the next king of Assyria now. Is coming up against Hoshea, who was the, the new king of Israel. So Pika died, right? Now the new king of Israel is here. And let's see what happened. Against him came up Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, and Hoshea, Hoshea became his servant and gave him presents. And, and the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt. And they brought and brought no present. To I think we got to refresh. Let's let's get a little bit more context. Let's go back to Second Kings chapter 15, maybe verse 25. Second Kings chapter 15, maybe verse 25. Give me 27. In the two and fiftieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Remliah, began to reign over Israel and Samaria. So and we went we back, right? If we look at the, the if we look at the kings, this is Pekah that comes right behind, right before Hoshea. So I just want to remind us how Pekah ended, what was going on when Pekah ended, and then it'll kind of make sense of what Hoshea is stepping into, right? So remember, while all this is going on, Pika is alive. Pika is the one that worked with Damascus to attack uh, Judah. Judah then, through King A Ahaz, King Ahaz said, yo, I need some help, Assyria. Assyria takes over Damascus, and then you have Israel that's still standing, right, under Pika. So now let's look at Pika's life again with that context, and let's see how this plays out. In the two and fifteenth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Remliah, began to reign over Israel in Samaria and reigned 20 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ion and Abel Beth, Abel Beth Micaiah, and Genoa, and Kadesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee. And all the land of Naphtali and carried them captive to Israel. Right. So remember, we read this before. So now you have more context of why the king of Assyria came and took all the people. He started to take captives under Pekah. He took the captive because Ahaz called him. And he said, yo, I need some help. Will you help me? So first he took Damascus. 
Then he took Israel, right? Now watch how he deals with Israel. And Hoshea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and smote him and slew him and reigned in his stead in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. And the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. Right. So now let's go to um, let's go back to uh, chapter 17. Because now we know how Jose Hoshea came in. We know how uh, Assyria came into the picture. So Hoshea walks into a situation where Assyria already has dominance over Israel. Hoshea has to kind of navigate and deal with that. But remember, Hoshea, after uh, Assyria had this dominance, Hoshea set Pekah up to kill him because he wanted to take over the kingdom. So you kind of got to imagine, you got to put yourself in his shoes. Hoshea probably don't like what's happening right now. Man, you let these Assyrians get at us? Remember how Jonah felt about the Assyrians, right? Jonah was looking like, man, I don't even want to go give a prophecy to the Assyrian because I know you're going to have mercy on them. So you can imagine that Hoshea don't like the Assyrians. But now the Assyrians got dominance over Israel. They collecting tribute. They, they, they ruling over them. They the kings over them, essentially. Hoshea probably not feeling it. So she is like, okay, I'm going to take this kingdom from Pika. He kills Pika and he becomes the king. Right? So now when he becomes the king, he inherits this relationship with Assyria, where he got to now sit here and be like, okay, he got to play politics. He got to play nice with him. You think Hoshea like that? Of course not. So now let's read back in chapter 17, second, uh, second Kings chapter 17. And let's see how Hoshea is dealing with this situation that clearly he doesn't like. In the 12th year of Ahaz, King of Judah began Hoshea, Hoshea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, the king of, Israel, king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his servant and gave him presents. And the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea. For mm -hmm. he had sent messengers to Saul, king of Egypt, and brought no present to the king of Assyria, and as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. Right. So first, the king of Assyria is like, yo, 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 I heard you over there communicating, communicating with Egypt. And he is like, and if that wasn't enough, you didn't send me your yearly gift like you be giving me. You know what I'm saying? You're not paying your tribute like you're supposed to be paying. Right? So Hoshea was probably trying to set something up. Like, yo, if we work together, we could take this dude. You know what I'm saying? He probably talking to Egypt like, listen, if we team up, we can take the boy, man. I'm telling you, we ain't got to be scared of him no more. I ain't sending them nothing this year. Egypt probably sent they stuff. They ain't like, man, you, you know what I'm saying? You crazy. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. But Egypt probably sent they stuff. But he's looking like, nah, man, let's not send it. So then Assyria, he got wind of it. He heard that he, he is talking to Egypt and he know he is sending the stuff. He said, okay, we're going to take care of that. So he bound them up. He took them and he put them in jail. Then he sent all his soldiers throughout Israel and he started to besiege Samaria, right? Which is where the king lives. So he already took the king out. And now he just, he, he, you know, he taking over the whole town. Watch what happens. And besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed him in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the city of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against Yahuwah, their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. And walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom Yahuwah had cast out from before the children of Israel, and the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly, secretly those things that were not right against Yahuwah their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense. In all the high places, and did that, and did the heathen whom Yahuwah carried away before them, 
and rock right. Ricky so it's telling you. He said, "Listen, Israel began to commit the same sins. So if we rewind all the way back, we was walking through the wilderness. We was with Moses. It was hot. We was hungry. But the Most High God told us, hey, just wait in this wilderness a little bit longer. Then eventually, we ended up going into Canaan." And Joshua took us and Moses prepared us for that. And Moses was telling us, these are all the sins that these people are, are committing. When y'all go over there, do not do the stuff that they was doing. He told us that he told, he said, listen, most I got to judge these people because they got all this sexual sin. They sacrifice all these other gods. They got all these weird practices. They sacrifice their own children. Only thing that he told them. Do not go over there and pick up their practices. Now, the most I got is letting them know y'all got taken captive. And you know reason why? Because y'all start doing the exact same stuff that the people that was here before you did to get judged. And now this is where you are. Right. Let's keep going. And there they burn incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away from before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they serve idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like the necks of their fathers that did not believe in Yahuwah their God. And they yep. rejected his statutes and his covenant and made and made with their fathers and their testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen. That when the word say God. vain is talking about empty. Right. They followed emptiness and they became empty. Right. That's a risk for any one of us. Any one of us. We get caught up in all this silly stuff, all these distractions, all this, all this stuff that's around us. We get caught up there and we start following it. And if we follow it, we become empty because we're following emptiness. The stuff don't, when they say empty, it means it's meaningless. It don't really mean nothing. There's only one thing that means something and that's this word because it takes us to a, a, an eternal life, right? Everything in this life, you think about it. What's the best you can do, right? Make a whole lot of money and then what happens? You yeah. die. Ooh, let's say, let's say you love by all the people in the world. Then what happens? You die. Right. So when the book is saying it's vain and it's empty, it's not saying that you don't get pleasure or you don't get some type of good feeling of what's happening right now. Of course you do. It's just that once it's all said and done, you die and then it's done. And all that stuff that you got, all that work you put in, everything that made you feel good is over. So then you have to ask yourself, what comes after I die? And if the answer to that is the eternal life, then the only way to get to that is this book. So that means the only thing that really means something is the book. It's what the Most High God is commanding of us. So if we follow after any of this other stuff and it don't got nothing to do with what the Most High God commanded for us, then it's empty. And that's what that's what the kings of Israel did. The kings of Israel from the very beginning, you have Jeroboam. And what he followed after is his own pride and glory. He said, I don't want the people of Israel to go down to Judah and start serving the most high God at the temple because they're going to want to live there in Judah. And the most high God gave me all this land. Remember, God gave him the land. God gave him all the territories. God gave him the tribes, right? So he's looking at the most high God blessed me with this and he getting his own head. You know what? If most high God blessed me with it, surely he wouldn't want these people to go down there. So I got an idea. Let me start sinning against what the Most High God told me to do. I'm going to create a golden calf to keep them here. I'm going to create other holidays to keep them here. And that's where the sin starts. That's vanity that he was chasing. He was chasing his own glory. He was chasing his own pride. We have to be able to separate ourselves from that, refocus ourselves on the word of the Most High God, right? Turn from all the sins that we be doing, all these other little, little stuff that we be chasing and going after and get that stuff out of our system so that we can follow the Most High God. Otherwise, we put ourselves in a position just like what we see in here, right? Everything is going smooth. We think everything is good. Then all of a sudden stuff starts to crumble. And the next thing you know, you taken out of the land. You taken out of your blessing. You taken out of the situation that you thought was comfortable. You take you taken out of the situation that you thought 
what's going to actually be successful for you in your van, your vain thoughts, your empty thoughts. Right. And then it's all bad. So now the people all got exiled. They got taken to Assyria and he's putting them in different towns and in different people's territory. So now he made you a foreigner, a captive amongst all these other people that's already well established. Does that sound familiar? Right. That's the same thing that the most high God did for us. Right. We'll get to it, but let's keep going. For they serve idols whereof the Lord had said unto them, you shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers saying, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and statutes according to the law, which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And That's they right. rejected his statutes and his covenant that had made that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom Yahuwah had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord, their God, and made them molten images, even two calves and made a grove and worshiped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they, right, they worshiped all the host of heaven. So in other words, they looked at the stars, right? They looked at all the lights that's in, in the sky. When the books say heaven, you remember, it's talking about sky. It ain't talking about what we think. You know what I'm saying? When they say heaven, it ain't always just talking about the throne of God. That's, that's you know what I'm saying? That's, that's you know, where, where God lives, right? That's not always what it's talking about. When they say heaven, it's just talking about the area above the sky, right? The atmosphere. Well, we kind of look at the atmosphere or, or the, uh, our outer space or whatever, right? So, it was looking at all the hosts of heaven. In other words, in this case, looking at outer space and looking at the, the stars and it's saying, I'm worshiping those. I'm bowing down to these things. I'm looking to these things for guidance, right? For specific spiritual guidance. Well, that's horoscopes. That's the same stuff that we're doing with horoscopes. We look at it and we just see it pop up on our phone and it say, uh, today, you know what I'm saying? What's the day? Uh, you know what I'm saying? September 8th. For a, a Sagittarius, today is going to be a good day for you. You know what I'm saying? But it's like these people are generating these messages based off of the alignments of the stars and all this different hocus pocus that they coming up with. And we end up going to it, worshiping it by getting the guidance, spiritual guidance from it. But that's a sin for us. Right? That's a sin for us. We have to put all that stuff away. You can't trust. You can't trust a horoscope and trust God at the same time. It's crazy. Right. But this is what they were doing. They made idols. Right. When we used to, if I ask people, what is an idol? They're going to say a false God. But that's not true. Idol don't have to be a false. Oftentimes, an idol is a false, false God. But that's not always true. Right. In our case, we made an idol of the true God, the living God, Yahuwah. We made an idol of him. We fashioned him to be like golden calves. Right. If you do that, you worship in Yahuwah. It's not a false God. You're just doing it in a way that he didn't approve. Right? So he said, don't, don't bring the idols into it. Keep going. Watch this. Zahar, come sit down. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of Yahuwah to, to, to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. And Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. For he right. So when he said cast them out of his sight, he's saying he take, took them out of Israel. Remember, we're going to uh, we're going we're going to kind of see why that makes sense. But Hosea kind of already gave us a hint. He told us, he said, you are not going to be my people. So he removed them from the land to signify that you are no longer my people, right? Y'all are no longer the people of the Most High God. So he removed them out of the sight. Keep going. And the, and the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until they had cast them out of his sight. For you rent mm -hmm. Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king, and Jeroboam drove Israel from following Yahuwah and made them sin a great sin. 
But the children mm -hmm. of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them. Until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. So when he say all his servants, the prophets, he talking about Isaiah. He's talking about Hosea. He's talking about Micah, who we haven't read yet. And he's talking about uh, Amos. Right. He said all these prophets I sent to give you a heads up, to let y'all know this was coming, to give y'all opportunity to turn around. Remember, the first book that we started off with was Jonah, who set, who gave us a pattern, right? Jonah gave us a pattern of a Gentile nation that once I hear the prophecy, I can repent and the Most High God will relent from the prophecy that he put forth, right? Jonah said to the Gentile nation, yo, if, look, this is about to happen, I think it was 40 days or 30, I think 40 days, you know what I'm saying? This X, Y, and Z is about to happen. Oh, the whole thing about to be shut down. The Gentiles heard that and they said, you know what? Repent. Make the animals darn make the animals darn fast. Nobody can eat food, not even animals. Everybody wearing sackcloth and ashes. Everybody stop. Stop what you're doing. Repent. We messed up. Most like God heard that and he said, Oh, you know what? I can work with these people. And so he didn't destroy the nation. At least not at that time. We're gonna we gonna learn he destroys it a lot later, a little bit later. But it's based off of the acts that the new king of Assyria is doing. Right. But originally that king, he delayed it to spare that king. Because that king said, you know what? We're going to do what the most high God said. We're going to stop this stuff. Zahar, your mama trying to get your attention. Right. He said, we're going to stop this stuff. We're going to shut this stuff all the way down. That was a pattern that the most high God showed us through Jonah. That that same thing could have been done. When the prophets went to Israel, when Amos went to Israel, when Hosea went to Israel, when Isaiah went to Judah, but Israel heard some of this stuff. Right. That same thing could have happened. They could have turned it around, but we didn't. We didn't turn it around. We didn't act like the, the Gentile nations. Right. For us, we kind of stayed in our own folly in our own foolishness. Right. So now the most high God had to, had to, you know what I'm saying, had to exile all the people and make us not his people, just according to the to the prophecy of Hosea. Let's keep going. Watch this. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kut. Kut so listen, Kuta. the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from where? Huta. I don't know how to say Huta. Huta. Punta. Puta. Puta. You know what I'm saying? Okay. He brought men from there. Where else? And from Ava. And from Hamath and from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. Right? So the first thing is the king of Assyria, the first king of Assyria, took over all of the northern tribes way up north. Then next, the king came in and besieged Samaria and took all those people out. So now our land is practically empty. Either people got killed. Or they got taken captive and sent over to different different uh, cities in Assyria's territory. Then the king of Assyria said that wasn't enough. I'm going to replace y'all. So he said, take people from Babylon, take people from all these other different cities, and we're going to put y'all in Assyria. So he did, I mean, uh, in Samaria. So he did a switcheroo, right? He took these other territories that he took over. And then he made them live in Israel, which he just took over and made Israel live in some of the cities that they were living in. Right. He did a switcheroo for all these people. So now Israel is populated. The northern tribes, the northern land is populated with Gentiles. That is important because it's going if you know that it's going to provide the context that you need when we get to the Gospels. Right. right. So right now we're looking at Samaria. Is being populated with Gentiles. That's people that's not like us. Right? Now these still dark skinned Gentiles. They still, you know what I'm saying? Unless some of them is like Indians or you know what we kind of see as Indians and stuff today. But nonetheless, they was Gentiles. Right? Keep going. They wasn't white folks though. Don't let nobody tell you that. And it was and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not Yahuwah. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore, they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, 
the nations which you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Right. So these people being superstitious, when they got to the land, it wasn't a lot of people in the land. Right. The land is practically empty. So what happens if you ever like, let's say you got in a, you got a house and people are living in it every day. Right. They probably clean the house. They probably spray when it's bugs and all that. Right. But then let's say you got an abandoned house and it's been sitting there for months. What's going to happen when you walk in the house? Is it going to be clean? Going to be bugs in there, all types of stuff, right? Because when there's nobody there to occupy the space, other things find a way in to occupy the space. Well, the same thing happens in the land, right? Animals begin to, because look, nobody's keeping the trees. So when the trees just start to grow and all that stuff, guess what's going to happen? More birds are going to be there. And so then when other animals are hungry and they see more birds, what are they going to do? They're going to eat them. And along come with the birds and the rats and all these other things, right? Everything going to be there. So then eventually lions is there too. Because you got all this activity coming over here. And what the lion going to do? Oh, that's lunch over there. Let me go get me some food. So the lion go over there and he start eating. So then the, the all these other Gentiles that get placed in Samaria, they come. Well, now the lions is here. So they getting eat up by the lions too. So they superstitious. They looking at it like, oh, this is happening because the gods of this land, they don't approve of us being here. We don't know the manner of this God. We don't know how to properly serve this God. So the king of Assyria, he don't know no darn better. Let's see what he do. Then the king of Assyria commanded saying, carry there one of the priests whom you brought from there and let them go and dwell there and let them teach them the manner of the God of the land. Right. So he took a priest from the northern tribe, a priest of israel and he said listen show these people how to serve your god now what's the problem with the priests of israel never served god they never served god they all they never served god properly rather right they always at the very beginning from when they split off they always had problems fix your eyes boy right they always had problems they always had the golden calves. So what do you think they're about to teach these Gentiles? The exact same thing. They're going to tell, oh, yeah, well, if you want to worship, you need to worship in Bethel or in Dan. And oh, bow down to these golden calves. That's how you serve the most high Yah. Right? They're going to tell, oh, but, and these are the holidays that you should keep. These are the, this is the tradition of our land. These are the things that we do. So that's the lesson that the Gentiles learned. They learned our stuff improperly. All this is a repeat. The Most High God is showing us this because the same thing happens again. And that's how we are where we are. Right. But we'll get to that. Keep going. And one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear Yahuwah. Howbeit, every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made Sukkoth Benoth, and the men of Kuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nib, 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 Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sepharvites burnt their children in fire to Adrimelech and Anemelech, the gods of Sepharvam. So they feared Yahuwah and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared Yahuwah and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from there. This is and exactly this day, what Gentiles do now. Right. Exactly what the Gentiles that teach us cause us to do now. Right. We walk around and we say we fear God. We love God. We believe the Bible. And at the same time, we fear our uh, uh, our horoscopes. We got darn crystals that we looking at, right? And we say, oh, well, this crystal gives off positive energy to me, right? The little uh, Himalayan salt, you know what I'm saying? You ever seen the Himalayan, you know what I'm saying? You walk around my, my job, 
you got these people with this Himalayan salt. And you can put a little light in it, and they say, you know what? This you got a darn darn Walmart light inside of this Himalayan salt, and all of a sudden that's supposed to bring you. Who tells y'all this stuff? But I'm crazy if I tell you, oh no, this book that was written, you know what I'm saying, thousands, thousands of years ago, that thing ain't right. They look at me like I'm crazy. Like, you're a kook. You're a religious kook. But you believe that some some darn salt. I chop that thing up and put it on my darn steak. Boy, what's wrong with you? Eat that thing. You know what I'm saying? You believe this salt, you put a little darn light bulb in it. A light bulb, you can walk down the lows right now and get you a light bulb, put it in there. That light bulb is going to mix with this darn Himalayan salt that tastes real good in my marinade. You know what I'm saying? That thing is, all of a sudden, that's going to bring me peace. Y'all let, look, y'all let these people call y'all crazy. They can't, they can't talk to me any kind of way. I don't let these people talk to me any kind of way because they do stupid stuff. These people believe and do stupid stuff. And they got us. They got a lot of our people saying, oh, not only do I believe God, but I also believe this and I also believe that. So you get to the point where people just like, well, I believe God exists, but I believe many gods exist. Or I just believe in the universe, right? I don't know the specific name of God. All that's a crapshoot for, I'm going to believe whatever I want to believe. And that's exactly what these Gentiles are doing because they come from their own land where they got their own gods. And you put them in this land. It's like, okay, well, I got to serve this God a specific way. Okay, well, I'm going to do both. I'm going to set up my God here and I'm going to set up this God. Makes sense, don't it? Yeah. To the most I God judge your butt. Right? Let's keep going. Until this day, they do after the former manners. They fear not Yahuwah. Neither do they, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom Yahuwah had made a covenant and charged them, saying, You shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But Yahuwah, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and in a stretched out arm, him shall you fear, and him shall you worship, and to him shall you do sacrifice. And the statutes and the ordinances and the law and the commandments which which he wrote for you, you shall observe to do forevermore. And you shall not fear other gods. And the covenant that I have made with you, you shall not forget. Neither shall ye fear other gods. But Yahuwah your God ye shall fear, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of your enemies. Albeit they did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared Yahuwah and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. All right, that's the end? Yeah. All right, so we're going to stop there because next we'll end up getting into King Hezekiah, right? So let's, let's kind of recap what we just, what we just experienced, right? Our brothers, right? Some of us, no doubt, comes from, you know what I'm saying, the northern tribes as well, right? But you have the northern kingdoms, we're all taken up. So let's remind ourselves who those northern kingdoms are, right? Let's look at it. We got, right now, Jotham we read, Jotham dies, right? Then Ahaz, Ahaz calls the king of, uh, the king of Assyria, here and he tells them hey come on down and help me out because the king of uh damascus and the king of israel were trying to attack right so he's saying listen you know what i'm saying why don't you help me out so the king of assyria takes over the king of damascus the king of assyria also begins to take captive many people sitting under pika in the king uh, in the kingdom of israel hosea don't like how it's playing out he tries to cut a deal. It don't work out the way he expected. The king of Assyria puts Hosea in captivity. Then he takes the whole land and puts them in captivity, then replaces the land with Gentiles that lived in that land. Then he let one priest come and start teaching the people the ways, the, the crooked ways of, of the, the previous Israelites that lived there. So Israel, you can see how it breaks here. Israel is no longer, right? Israel is now in exile. So let's kind of look at this. 
and kind of see what we have coming up next, right? So this is done. This is all cut off at this point, right? Judah continues. The next king that we're going to read about with Judah is Hezekiah. He's the son of Ahaz, right? We're going we're gonna to walk through Micah a little bit, and we're going to read through a little bit more of Isaiah during that time period. Then there's a lot of Isaiah that deals with Hezekiah directly. So we're going to talk about all of that, right? Then we're going to continue to go. But eventually, our temple ends up being destroyed. So just like the kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, Judah um, has a similar fate, right? So we're going to kind of get there. But let's kind of talk about the two different uh, houses of Israel. So this is the northern tribes. So you got Ephraim, Reuben, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Asher, Gad, Naphtali, and Manasseh. Those are the tribes. If they didn't escape, escape and go to Judah, those are the tribes primarily that were taken, right? Of course, you got Levites in that group too. You got Benjamin in that group. And you probably got some people in Judah got, that got caught up there. But the, the kingdom of Judah is made up primarily of the Levites, the Benjamin, the Benjamites and uh, of Judah. Primarily those stayed. So those still exist and they're about to be ruled by Hezekiah, the king Hezekiah. So it's a lot that we're going to get into with Hezekiah. He's a, he has a pretty full story. We'll spend a little bit time, a little bit of time on him and then we'll kind of go on. Right. Any questions before we wrap? Oh, it looked like we got one already. This is why we pray for forgiveness of our forefathers. Yes, that, that is exactly right. That is exactly right. We should all, in our prayers, we should always be praying for our sins, right? And when I say praying for our sins, what I mean is confession of the sins, right? We should all, you are disgusting, right? Why are y'all be messing with your eyes like that? What's wrong with y'all? <laughs> But we should always be confessing our own sins and confessing the sins of our father. And when we confess our sins, we shouldn't just stop at, oh, God, I know I sinned or God, I know my father sinned. Right. My ancestors sinned. That's good. But we can't stop there. We also have to say, and God, I know that you walked contrary to us because we walked contrary to you. Right. Your hand has been against us because we have been against you. That's important. That's an important aspect of it. It's an important piece of it. We have to acknowledge that God has been working against us. If we kind of kind of keep keep putting it in our mind that, oh, well, it's been bad, but God's been by my side this whole time. That means we don't believe his book. That's not what he's been saying. He has not been by our side this whole time. He has not been looking over us the whole time. God has been with his arms stretched out, whooping our butts, trying to get our attention. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to say, okay, you know what? I've been ignoring you and you've been ignoring me. We sit here, we make concessions. We, we pray to God, you know, God, give me a million dollars. I really want a million dollars. Then we get a dollar in the mail. Oh, well, you know what? God gave me a dollar. He answered my prayer. Stop that line. He didn't answer. You asked for a million dollars. Don't try to switch it up. Well, you know, he may not have gave me what I thought I wanted, but he gave. But, you know, whatever God gave you is better than what. No, 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 no. That thing was chance. That was circumstance. You know what I'm saying? God ain't had nothing to do with that foolishness. He's working against you. You still a sinner. You ain't turned from your darn sin. We we should listen. It's no reason. It's people sitting here like you trying to say that God don't do good stuff. It's, that's not what I'm saying. There is no, there is nothing in this book for us to set the expectation for ourselves that anything good is happening to us on our account when we're in sin. We should see everything as a setup. If we still sinning, everything that happened to you that seemed like it's good, you should see it as a setup. That's why in the beginning we say anything that does happen can and will be used against you in the day of judgment. That is a setup. Because why would anything good happen to a sinner? Why would you even make yourself comfortable with that thought? It seemed good. It feel good. But guess what? If you don't turn from sin, it ain't good. You get all the riches in the world. You don't turn from sin. You go to hell. How is that good? Riches are good. You turn from sin. You turn from sin. You get all the riches. Oh, man, that's a blessing there. 
That's a blessing. Most I got, most I got bless you and it caused you to turn from sin. That is a blessing. Or if you already turned from sin, he bless you with something. That is a blessing. Ain't no blessing that is you, you in sin, you living in sin, living in rebellion. And the most high God is letting good stuff happen to you. Nah, that's a setup. Ain't no blessing. That's a setup. You have to change. We have to change the way we think about this stuff. But what happens is we get to thinking in our own head that for our own pride and for our own comfort, God has been with me this whole time. That's a sin. That's a, that's a lie. That's a lie. So, yeah, you definitely got to pray. Pray for the ancestors uh, or not pray for the ancestors, but confess the sins of the ancestors. Confess the sins of ourselves um, and make sure that we confess that, that we've been walking contrary to most our God as well as he's been walking contrary to us. Any other questions? Grace study, no questions. No questions. All right. Well, y'all know we got a fellowship hour tomorrow, four o'clock Pacific time. Uh, come one, come all. Y'all are all welcome. Um, if you need the information, you have to reach out to me. Last time I opened it up to the whole world, you know, there's a bunch of weirdos that got on there. You know what I'm saying? Y'all remember that bunch of weirdos jumped on that thing. We had to kick some folks out. Um, so you got to reach out to me, shoot me a text. The number is on the screen. Uh, and then we can, uh, we can, we can send you the link so you can join fellowship hour. Otherwise, uh, you know, we'll see you next week. Sabbath peace. And let's pray out. Press the, uh, Press the end stream button, boy.